This is George Dion of the Rock is George podcast, and this is a KNAC.com exclusive interview with bassist Ronnie Parks of the German heavy metal act Bonfire. If I knew absolutely nothing about Bonfire, how would you describe the band's music to me? Uh, Bonfire is a band from Germany, and uh, it's, I would say, hard rock, similar to like somewhere between Scorpions and Judas Priest and uh, music like that. On September 22nd, Bonfire released a series of releases through AFM Records. These are 2023 versions of the first Bonfire albums, Don't Touch the Light, Fireworks, and Point Blank. My first question on these is, why did Bonfire decide to revisit these albums versus making a brand new album? Well, uh, we we have made a lot of brand new records already. Um, but we started back in 2021, I, I would say. We started to get involved in making a documentary about the band. And um, we found out that we didn't have the rights to the original recordings. So our, our thought process was, well, let's everybody else is doing this now. Let's just re-record them. That way we, we get the rights back. And also now it's available on... Uh, Spotify and all these other platforms that they it wasn't on actually, you know, because the, this record, these records were released in like 1986, 87, and 88 or 89. There, they, uh, the record label, we're not with the same record label anymore, and we don't even know who has the rights at this point. So, that, that was basically the reason that we did it. Um, but in the process, our singer. Uh, we had a falling out with the, with the vocalist and he left the band. So it, it just seems a little strange that all of a sudden we got a new singer and now we came out with three old albums. So it, it actually, the albums were already recorded. The other singer, his vocals were already recorded, but we had to, we didn't want to put it out with the old singer. So we did it with the new singer and that's, that's the reason for the old ones, but we do have a new album coming out next year in uh, July. 2024. Like you mentioned, you you have a new singer. It, it's Diane Mayer, I believe, is the way you pronounce. Yeah, it. yeah, he, Diane Mayer from uh, he's from Greece. And this is a good way to introduce uh, fans to uh, his sound by taking the classic material and kind of updating it uh, because it better reflects what you're going to sound like when you're out there on the road. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, we like I said, we we did already record it with the old vocalist Alex, but when he left, we said, okay, well, we, we can't we can't now have a new singer and release stuff with the old singer, and um, we we tried him out for a few songs like as a demo, and he he really nailed it. So we're like, okay, this is the way to go. Obviously, we did that, and it, and we feel it came out really good. You know, uh, I know some people are always like. Oh, what are you recording old stuff for? It's no comparison. But in actuality, we're we're not trying to compare them. We're not trying to be better than the original recordings or something. It's just, it's a new recording. We did it to get our rights back. You know, they're good songs. So people who weren't fans of Bonfire before can now appreciate and listen to these songs and get them on their normal platforms like Spotify and wherever else, you know, because they weren't available. Yeah, you've absolutely made great points in, in that respect that these early albums aren't readily available. You'd really have to dig and hunt for them. And yeah. uh, the rights issue is a common thing, certainly for guys that signed record deals in the 80s. It seems like they <laughs> yeah. turned their life away. Yeah, I mean, that's that's no secret. I mean, there's so many bands that did that. And, you know, you're you're young and you get a record contract and it's a big record contract with a big label like MCA or... DMG or, you know, RCA, little do you know, you're actually signing your whole life away. Uh, you don't even, you don't even own these recordings. You don't have the rights to them. They have all the rights. And then later on, when you mature a little bit, then you find out and it's uh, a little too late. How did you guys discover Diane and how did you come to the conclusion that he's the guy? Yeah, it was funny because, you know, when he left, like I said, we had just finished recording his vocals for the records. And we're like, okay, now we're really in a in a mess here. We, you know, we we didn't we were happy with Alex. Everything was going fine until they just 
there was just one blowout and then the whole thing went a weird way. So we were looking for, for a singer and all of a sudden we got a message that uh, one of the bands that opened for us in Greece, the guitar player is a really good singer and he would love to audition. So we said, okay, you know, send us, send us some videos of you singing. So he sent a couple of videos and we're like, okay, this guy looks really good. He sounds great. Is it, is maybe it's not really him though, you know, like, cause we started to say like, okay, this guy is totally unknown as, as a singer. Like he, he was a guitar player and his band wasn't really on a record label or anything. So he never had any really big success. So, so he was virtually unknown. And we're like, okay, maybe why, why is this guy not singing in a band and why are we just finding him now? So we, we really started to think like, okay, this must be fake or something. Like he's got some kind of recording going behind him. And uh, so, so we sent him a couple of the tracks from the record and said, okay, well, why don't you try singing on these and let's see what it sounds like. And he just did an amazing job. And there was a place where he really like went off and, and did some really cool stuff that we didn't expect. And we're like, wow, that was really cool. Like, you know, you get the goosebumps and you're like, wow, that was really good. So we said, okay, this is the guy, you know, and I called him on the phone. And he's like, he was like so excited because he was actually a bonfire fan when he was younger. And his, he said he would, he would, uh, his family would often go from, from uh, Athens to Thessaloniki on the weekends for like a little vacation and stuff. And his dad had a, had a CD, a cassette and it had bonfire on. It. And that's how he became a bonfire fan. So for him, this was like some kind of a dream come true that, he got to he got to sing with his he's in, he's in like one of his dream bands you know i think i saw that story in the rockstar movie with mark Wahlberg. <laughs> yeah yeah it's exa- it's kind of almost the same thing revisiting the back catalog here uh i noticed that you guys kind of went into the deeper material when it came to the singles you didn't go with the the known hits and the normal stuff that's in your set list yeah, I mean, well, actually, uh, some of these songs we do normally play live in our set, like SDI and, and Ready for Reaction. And Who's Fool and Who was, was a, was a kind of hit song, actually. We also released that one from, uh, from this. I mean, the plan was, since it was three albums and so many, so many songs, that the, the record label wanted to do eight releases, eight singles. <laughs> um, so we just kept picking... We just kept picking a song from each album, you know, and we didn't really want to pick the the super big hits because it's just, I don't know. We just went with these songs. We're like, oh, these came out pretty good. You know, let's do this one. And and Who's Fool and Who is just, it's a really great song. And we had somebody who had a whole vision for actually Diane's friend uh, from Greece. He had a whole vision for the video and we basically let him go and do what he wanted to do. And, it, and it, you know, we feel it came out really good. We're, we're definitely happy with it. But, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't the big hit songs, but it was the some songs that we actually do play live. Besides the vocals, did you go back and fix any of the music portions of the songs or did you try to stay true? Uh, to the- yeah, we tried to stay as true as possible, but also may, at the same time, make it a little bit more modern, but not change it too much. So it's there's little slight differences here and there. Uh, one of the big differences is that the the first album, "Don't Touch the Light," that was recorded in 1986, I believe, and that was recorded in standard tuning. And then after that, the band uh, dropped the half step tuning, and the rest of the albums are all in uh, half step down. But uh, so Hans in the light of not making them exactly the same and re-recording it one for one, he wanted to lower that album a whole step, which I don't know. We, we all felt it was kind of strange. Um, but his, his thought process was that, you know, with our old singer, his, his strong range was really like the higher range. So he figured, okay, well, if I make this lower, then he's singing, he's going to sing higher. So it's, it'll work, you know? But then when Dying came in, it was like, okay, well, we didn't need to do that, but we did it. So let's just make the best of it and, and do it the best way that we can. And we, we feel like we kind of did that. There were some songs like it just seemed too low to sing in the, 
the normal register because we tuned down all step. So, so he had to sing high, you know, and, and I, I did so, see some complaints on Facebook, like, Oh, uh, he's, why is he screaming over everything? Why is it so, you know, but he had no choice. He had to do that because we, we detuned the song, you know? So yeah, it is what it is. I mean, I, to me, I think it's you know, overall, everything sounds really pretty good. You guys also updated the artwork on Don't Touch the Light. The kids have grown up on fireworks. Yeah. You have more yeah. fear on Point Blank. You replace the the woman uh, with a monk. So obviously there must have been uh, some talk about this before going in to change it. Yeah, yeah. It was the same thing with the record, with the covers. You know, we didn't want to change everything too much. We didn't want to make. It, it, like I said, it was, it's not supposed to be some kind of a competition. Like this is supposed to be better than the original recordings or something. The mm-hmm. original recordings are, are great and they are what they are. And these are just, they're just re-recorded, you know, they're, they're new versions. Uh, and, and for the reasons, like I said before, you know, to just make them more available and, and so that other people who don't know the band can appreciate the songs. In in addition to probably being, available streaming for the first time you guys have this collection on vinyl as well yeah yeah and they did like you know vinyl actually it's funny because now vinyl sells more than cd um but you know so every release that we do we normally put out some kind of different colored discs or some kind of like collector's discs you know so that that was also always in the plan for it and you could buy them as a box set, like all three together, or you could buy them separately or however, you know. And and also, Hans is writing a book um, because uh, Hans has uh, bipolar manic depression. Oh. So it has uh, affected the band or his life in a lot of ways. Um, but he decided that uh, when we were doing the documentary, he also was doing the book at the same time. So the documentary somehow fell through with the partners that we had but the book is continuing and and the book will be released with the new album next year and And, uh it's really pretty cool i mean he's got a lot of pictures and stories about the old band and also about his you know living life with bipolar and how it affected the band like in in the beginning in uh in 1996 maybe bonfire did a uh a play and it was a musical and it was called the Rauber and uh, Bonfire performed in the play twice a day, every day they performed for, and it was was very, very successful. And, uh, but at that time, that is when Hans first got diagnosed with bipolar. So they had put him into the, and he was like full blown, you know, straight Jack would go and pick him up from the hospital and bring him to the shows and then he would play the shows and then bring them back to the hospital. So <laughs> it was kind of crazy, you know, the way that it, it went through. But it still somehow it still worked. And, uh, you know, everything still continues. So it, it, so the book also talks about how he how you can live a normal life. You know, he stopped drinking. He doesn't do drugs anymore. He doesn't do anything. And and he takes his medication and. It, it actually works. You know, he can he can live a normal life. And the name of that book is Rock and Roll Survivor, My Bipolar Life and Bonfire. Yeah, that's going to be pretty cool to come out. And, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to it. I've seen some little parts of it and I know all the pictures and I know a lot of the stories already, whether they made the book or not. I don't know. But <laughs> uh, I, I know there's a ton of really good stories and. And a lot of a lot of stuff. I mean, you know, he went into the hospital twice actually, because we did a we did a tour in 2018, and we had uh, all these different singers, and we released a, a double album with that. It was all covers called Legends, and w- so we had uh, Jeff Tate, we had um, Dave Bickler from Survivor, uh, we had Johnny Gioelli from Hardline. We had a, a couple of German artists, Chris Bodendorf from Gravedigger and uh, Quaster from the Pooties, which was a very big Eastern German band. They were very, very popular uh, back in the 70s and the 80s. Um, 
we had Robin Beck on there. So, so we had a whole bunch of people. And at the end of this tour, when it ended, it kind of ended up crashing for a lot of different reasons. You know, all, all this time also, we, we didn't have a manager. Uh, we got rid of our manager because he ripped us off, you know, back in like 2016 or something. Mm -hmm. So we stopped working with him and then we started uh, running everything, basically hogs. And so we put this huge tour together and it was going to be this big thing. And we had investors. And in the beginning, Hans is like, well, you know, we, we booked some pretty big rooms and uh, we, we got good ticket sales, but they're not quite filling up the room. Maybe we should cancel this and, and try it again, like with smaller rooms or something or, or something, you know. And the investors were like, well, you know, this is, uh, this is the first time you're doing it. So when things, your first time you do it, it doesn't always go so great. And, and then the next time it's better, you know. So let's just take the losses and we'll write it off and then we'll do it again next year. And we said, okay, let's do that. So we started doing it and the tour progressed. And then halfway through the tour, the investor said, hey, we're not putting any more money in this. Or <laughs> we don't have any more money. So then it crashed. And at that point, Hans was so stressed out and so from doing, I mean, we were on tour. Then we did this double recording. Um, then we also, he was planning and booking all these rooms and, and the artists and dealing with everything. And it was just so much stress that he couldn't, you know, it was a two and a half hour show on top of the whole thing. So it, it was like 35 songs or something like that. Uh, with an intermission in the, in the middle, it was really long. And um, so he, at the end of this, he broke down again and ended up in the hospital again for another 12 weeks. And it was kind of the same situation. You know, we had a little acoustic show booked and um, it was right near his hospital. So we went to the hospital and picked him up and like, you know, he was released. So he had like a painting that he painted in the hospital and a suitcase and, you know, all this stuff. And we, Picked him up in the van. He got in the van. We went right to the show and played a show. <laughs> so there was like rest or anything, just like, you know, right from the hospital, right to the show. <laughs> but he's do he's definitely doing better now, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now he's doing really good. And, and the book is, in some way, it's, it's a kind of therapy, too, I guess, because he gets to really talk about everything and, and how he did it. I mean, he is, again, a little bit stressed out because... At the same time as he's writing his book, we're also working on the new recordings. And we're also, uh, we have a tour coming up in uh, probably about 25 days or something. <laughs> For November, we have some shows. And then uh, December, we have two shows uh, in Cyprus, December 1st and 2nd. And then we're in France on the 9th and then in Belgium on the 15th. And then back in Germany in the beginning of January. So, so we got all this stuff kind of going on and, uh, you know, so he's a little bit stressed out, but he's doing okay. I talked to him this morning, actually. So these tour, these tour days that you have coming up, are you going to be focusing on the re-recordings of these three albums? Yeah. Yeah. All, all the shows so far that we've played this year, um, we, we've done a couple in Germany. Uh, I think we played one in Switzerland. We did one, uh, one or two in Austria. And we did uh, Romania and Bulgaria. And uh, we did, basically, we're doing only songs from these three albums right now for this tour. And we're calling it like the Origins Tour, you know, like it's the beginning of the band and the beginning of everything. Yeah, we're just playing songs just from this. And we're playing these versions, not the original versions. And they're switching guitars, which is kind of crazy, you know, because uh, some of them are tuned down a whole step. So, and the other ones are half step. So, so the tuning's not the same. So they have to switch guitars. So we had to kind of figure out how to place them and stuff, you know, so that they don't have to switch, play a song and switch a guitar and play another song and then switch guitar. And, you know, so we have to kind of bunch them together. But um, yeah, I mean, the, the set's really strong. It's really good. It's all known songs. You know, there's nothing on there that people won't know that mm -hmm. no bonfire anyway. And um, they're really great versions. I mean, Dine's a, a great, he's really an incredible singer. He's getting a lot of flack because people are unfairly comparing him to Klaus Lessman. And it's, it's not really a comparison. And there's no need to compare, compare the two 
but you know, people just do for some reason. I don't know why. Klaus is a great singer and had his great points. And Diane is also a great singer and has his great points. And um, I mean, Diane really has a lot of talent. He's able to improvise on anything, just on the moment. Any key doesn't matter. He, he can do basically anything he wants to do, he can do, you know, which, which is really great for a singer. And he's got a lot of stamina. He can really hold out for a long time. So um, we're really looking forward. This is going to be the first time actually in November uh, when we do these shows. We start on the 31st, and I think we go through November 20th. And um, so th this will be the first really large batch of shows we did all together. Everything else has been like maybe three shows or two shows, you know. So, and, and but he did great on everything. But uh, this is going to be the first time where we're doing a real long, a long run with him, you know. What are the chances of seeing Bonfire in the U.S.? I know you're based in the U.S. Yeah, I yeah I live in New Jersey, um, and I'm actually here right now. I would love I would love for the band to play here, but um, like I said, we we don't have a manager right now, and those are the kind of things like a manager sets up, yeah. you know, um, because we have to get an agent in the U.S. And I mean, maybe if we hooked up on a tour with someone, it would work. Uh, and maybe be more visible, like that we can vision it. But the problem now is that, you know, we're very established in Europe and people know the band. So where we play, people show up. And to come here in the U.S., it's super expensive. Everybody has to get visas. The flights are astronomical now. So everybody has to fly. And then do we fly crew over as well? Um, you know, that's even more money. And then, okay, what are we playing on? What equipment are we using? Do we have to rent the van? Are we going to get a tour bus? Like, how are we going to travel around? So right. there's just so much expense, and 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 it's, it's so unknown. I mean, Bonfire only played here in the U.S. They played in 1986. Um, they did play um, Rock, Oklahoma in like 2010. Mm -hmm. um, but other than that, they really haven't played in the U.S. We know we have U.S. fans, and we know there are definitely people here, but we're not sure what we would draw, actually. We don't know what we draw a 1,000 people, what we draw 200 people. <laughs> you know, We don't know. So it's, it's hard to really guess and plan out a whole tour not knowing what you're going to do. And, it, and it's so much easier to just stay where we are because that's a, that's a given. We know what's going to happen there. And there's plenty of places to play. You know, it's not like we're running out of places to play. We're playing all all different countries who play there, and uh, even uh, I think this year they were they were talking about going to like Argentina or somewhere. So that was also very cool. That would that would be great. Yeah, I mean, also there was talk of Colombia, going to Colombia, which would be pretty cool. I mean, they really like metal down there, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, so that, that would be cool. Mexico would be awesome. Mexico City that would be great. But uh, yeah, anywhere in the U.S. We almost, actually, we almost did a couple of runs because we were setting up the documentary and Accept had a couple of shows here in New York. And so I said, hey, why don't we just jump on the bill with those guys? We'll just play like one or two shows and then, you know, we could get some film for the documentary and all this stuff and see see how we do, you know? And it was all set. We talked to their manager and it was all set. And then something happened and they're like, no, 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 no. You guys can't open for us. No. So, so I don't know why that is. <clears throat> there could be a reason. I don't really know. Maybe there's not because I, I heard there was some stuff from our old manager because, you know, bonfire and, and except, uh, except was recording Russian roulette. Um, when we were recording, uh, don't touch the light, I believe. So they were in the same studio, but in different, different rooms, you know? So like they, we, I think bonfire guys sang backgrounds on the, on the accept album and stuff. And bonfire had some other different things, but somewhere in there, there was a problem with an old manager. So I don't know if that became an issue with the remaining band members who are still, still, you know, from both bands. So right. I, I'm not sure exactly why it didn't happen, but at first we got the okay. And then later we got a no. So I don't know what happened there. 
Ronnie, how'd you get the gig in uh, Bonfire? Back in, uh, I would say, 2000 and, uh, 2010, maybe. I think it was 2010. I was in a band uh, on Kivel Records, which is a, a, a label based out of New York City. Um, and uh, it was I was in a band called Tango Down. And David Reese was the singer at the time. And oh, yeah. David Reese used, used to be the singer in Accept for, for one album. Um, so when Hans was, uh, the bonfire was starting to have a lot of internal problems and things weren't going well. And Hans wanted to resurrect his solo band. So he called Michael Voss, uh, who's another well-known musician in Germany. And um, he's a, he also does a lot of recording and different stuff. So he says, hey, man, I'm looking for a singer. You know, any ideas? He's like, yeah, what about uh, David Reese? He goes, hey, that's not a bad idea. So he contacted David. And at the time, I was doing so much stuff for David's solo project. Um, like, you know, I was doing interviews and I became his uh, band director, like the leader of the band. And I got all the other players and um, set up shows and did the merchandise and did, set up interviews and all kinds of stuff. So he goes, you know what, man, you did so much stuff for me. The next call I get, I'm going to bring you with me. And the next call he got was from Hans Zilla. And, uh, and he kept to his word. He, he brought me with him. He said, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely do it, but I got to bring this bass player. And Hans said, okay. And uh, we started doing it. And unfortunately, Bonfire and David parted ways back in 2016. And um, I'm still there, but David's not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Are you still friendly with David? Uh, no. No, actually, <laughs> I mean, I, 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 you know, there was a little bit of hard feelings, but um, basically, you know, I don't want to get into our dirty laundry, but somehow he mistakenly thinks that I knew that the band was going to kick him out. And I didn't know because they didn't want to tell me because they thought I would tell him. Right. So they kept it a secret from me as well. And then they, they popped it on me the day that they were kicking him out. And this was still, we still had this manager that we kicked out. And, and, you know, that was actually the reason for the whole thing because Dave and Hans fought so much about this manager because David didn't trust him and Hans did. And, you know, Hans, I don't want to say he, he was taken advantage of, but this guy took advantage of him <laughs> you know he was he's a real he was a real like used car salesman type guy he can oh, yeah. say you know he's a really good talker he, he when you first meet him you like him but then you know next thing you know he's he's just robbed you blind and you didn't even see it you know <laughs> so yeah so david was seeing that kind of stuff and heard different things about him and was really putting up a big fight and then this fight just became between those between hans and and david so when David got kicked out, it was just like, uh, it was really probably one of the worst shows of my life, actually. It was in Italy, and, uh, and this was the show that they were going to announce. Well, not announce, but tell David that uh, it was time to part ways. Um, and it was Italy versus Germany in World Cup at the same <laughs> time. So now David's living in Italy. We're playing in Italy. And Germany and Italy are playing soccer, and they're holding up the show because of it's the they they went into overtime in the game. So, and then that's kind of when David found out, and now it was really like a whole so much tension and so much uh, I don't know. Dave was like a caged tiger, you know. And then I'm on the stage, and me and him were really good friends, and and you know there was one point where. Like I said, they, you know, him, Hans and Dave were really fighting a lot. And there was one point where David really was fighting with Hans almost physically at that point. And, and Hans was just taking it and taking it. And then finally he said, that's it. Get out, get out of the van. You know, he kicked him out of the van. And David had told me a story about how except had did that to him as well. <laughs> ah. So, so then I said, uh, you know, okay, I'll go with you. And so, you know, I, I, the band took off and me and Dave were standing there and we took a, a cab back to the hotel, you know, and I, I didn't want to quit the band and I didn't want to leave. Um, 
I wasn't happy about what was happening with Dave, but Dave actually started to attack me as if I knew what was going on and I was part of the plan to do it. And I really wasn't. So we kind of had some things like a little thing there. And so since then we haven't actually spoke and, and we, we actually, we almost played on the same bill of a show, but it was supposed to be separate days, but that didn't happen. So, I mean, there may be a show you never know where he's on the same bill as us. And then maybe that's when we'll see each other. But, I have no intention to to reach out and call him. I don't want to, you know, a, a friend of mine who also was part of this band, a, a friend, Paul Morris, uh, he's a keyboard player. He played an easy living with us. He did a lot of the bonfire keyboard recordings. He was in Rainbow. He was in TSO and stuff. And um, he he knows the whole situation with David. And he's like, you know what? Just think of it like a piece of driftwood. Like it just comes in from the ocean and then it just goes back out into the ocean. Just let it go, man. Don't contact him. Don't try to reach out to him and try to tell him your story or whatever. Just He goes, just let it go, man. Just let it go. And that's kind of what I did. I just kind of let it go. I mean, I'm, I'm okay with it. It was a lot of stress at the time, you know, but that was a couple of years ago. And he's doing his thing. I'm doing mine. So, And maybe we'll see so down the road that time heals all wounds. Yeah, either that or, or he'll attack me or something. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he'll do that. That's the optimistic <laughs> New Jersey attitude right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Plus, yeah. And the other New Jersey attitude was like, go ahead, man. Try it. <laughs> <laughs> Before I let you go, Ronnie, you mentioned new bonfire music in the second half of next year. Do you have an album title yet? Um, yeah, actually, we're kind of looking at higher ground Yeah, as the title. Um, whether that's going to actually stick or not, I don't know. Uh, it depends because we just started recording. So we have like maybe a couple of basic tracks, like not even full, like, you know, there's, there's maybe a couple of guitars, but not all the guitars, no keyboards. They might not even be finished drums yet. No vocals, no bass. So, and maybe we have that for like three or four songs. So you never know by the time the album's finally ready, we may have a different title by then, but right now the title is going to be higher ground. Well, those are all the questions I have for you today, Ronnie. The new Bonfire releases, re-recordings of Don't Touch the Light, Fireworks, Point Blank, 2023 versions through AFM Records, available now. They sound great. I I like the sound of this band and where it's going right now, and I want to thank you for taking the time to uh, tell me more about it. Thank you, man. Thank you. It was great talking to you.